You know, one way in which my, I don't know whether or not my ideas differ from yours or not, but I'll just throw, the, I'll throw them out there. Um, one of the things that I think has to happen is that I think that public media has to partner more with commercial media. And some people may say yes, some people may say no. Here's, here's the perspective I'm coming from. Having worked at places from ABC to CNN to MTV and Oxygen, and dealing with a lot of younger audiences who don't care about the news period, let alone you know, whether or not it's public media or private media, I think that you have to go where the eyeballs are. And I see places like Vice cutting content deals with CNN.com. And if any of you guys know what Vice is, they do a lot of provocative, vulgar content. And they were highly criticized for the content deal that they cut with CNN.com. But it happened. So why isn't public media, if public media's got a good product, why isn't public media out there cutting those deals and getting those eyeballs? Are we too good to try to have an audience? Are we playing too nice to no. try to reach people? No, I mean, we do, we do co-productions with uh, broadcasters around the world, and they are both commercial and, and public. And um, there's no reason I can't do and have done uh, co-productions with commercial broadcasters. So uh, WCCO in Minneapolis was a famous documentary production unit, and I used to do a lot of co-productions with them, with a local, and I'm, I've talk, been talking to a number of the investigative units that are still the few that are left in, 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 in really good um, uh, major markets uh, about doing work together. So I think there are possibilities in the broadcast level, and certainly there's no reason why I mean, I've done co-productions with Nightline, and I've done, but that's hardly the demographic we're talking about. Um, but but I, I th th there's no reason why we can't actually find ways to create and leverage production with, uh, it's always the question of, of in, in a relationship with a commercial broadcaster of, um, of whether or not you end up as second place and you don't, and they get the major window and you get the second window and so public broadcasting becomes the kind of poor step cousin you know that that gets the sort of the time, and they say, "Well, we'll do the piece on Sunday, and you can do the rest of the story on Tuesday." And I say, "No, well, why the hell should I? <laughs> I mean, I want to. I want the scoop. I don't want to give it to you. And 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 by the way, you've got more than enough money to do it yourself. So, um, but I, I I think there are relationships. I think you just have to be. You have to look for 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 how to strengthen public media in it. I mean, ha and and indeed, perhaps getting audiences is important for us." to be able to, to do this. Well, you know, John, it strikes me that in, in the U.S., because of some of the, the funding realities that exist right now, whether or not they'll change in the future, perhaps uh, a gathering like this will have uh, some, you know, effect that will help spread the power and the wealth that's allocated to public media. But right now, public media in the U.S., proportionately has so much less money than in the UK. But you seem, you know, to be interested in this idea as well of what do partnerships look like. So what does a partnership look like to you from your perspective? Well, I think some of the value we can add, uh, the most significant value we can add to partners is through the platforms that we create and unlocking ability to reach uh, the eyeballs, as, as you put it, and get that level of visibility. So if I take an example, um, the emergence of IPTV and the fusing of, of the you know television set in the front room with your with your internet connection, making sure that there is a um, uh, you know a gateway there, the rendering of that experience where you know public media has a good share of the visibility. That's something we are absolutely uh, uh, keen to do. Or equally online, we've got a very successful uh, VOD um, platform. I think second only to to Hulu uh, in in the world in terms of numbers of people using it. Uh, called iPlayer, and again, we want to work with other cultural bodies to get uh, to get space and access. And we're announcing something very shortly that will give uh, uh, other players access to our VA VOD portal. So enable them to piggyback on the BBC scale. Uh, I think is uh, hugely important, both at home and around the world. Um, that's not to say smaller scale uh, participation isn't welcome around the edges. But I think, as David said, there's often a lot of um, how to put it, it's quite asynchronous in terms of the interface, so it's quite difficult to get right. Um, I, th I think there are, around digital media, some really big investment humps you have to go uh, get over with. I mean, it's, it's easy to talk of, of buying an, an HD you know, video camera, tape, tapeless production and everything else. 
Uh, the reality is, if you want to do it consistently in scale of high quality, actually there's a big investment hump, you know, and it's hard to get over that. Um, so uh, giving creative industry uh, entrepreneurs access to some of our scale through platforms and occasionally through, not, not actually not occasionally, increasingly routinely access to studio equipment and the kind of equipment they wouldn't be able to use is, is very important to us. But we are quite fastidious about keeping free of... Um, you know, uh, commercial interests. That's something we, we take very seriously. So if we ever get the impression that an editorial call has anything to do with a sort of uh, commercial motivation, instantly we'll back away. Um, but, but you know, the interesting, uh, my memory of, of uh, 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 having been in public television and doing co-production for the BBC, I did the first one in 1973, um, but I, uh, we used to do a lot of co-production for the BBC and a lot of the content in public Broadcasting was built on that relationship, and then the Discovery Channel discovered public television, and basically took elements of it and began to build itself out. And when the BBC began to look across the p the pond and say, "Okay, well now we can get some serious money out of these Discovery guys," there was a deal done, an output deal from the BBC, and and I I watched it happen because I I watched it happen to my colleagues at the BBC to see how the content changed because of the discussions that were happening because the Discovery Channel leverage definitely affected a certain number of serious programs that began to not get you know pass muster with the uh, with the with in the conversations with the dis you know with Discovery Channel and there was a real cultural shift which may have shifted again. Uh, well but I can, I'm not I can sure. make a small confession in, in that regard. We, we have a very well-reputed natural history strand yeah. of programming, as you know, Planet Earth, Life on Earth, uh, and so on. Um, and they're narrated in the UK and around the world by a very uh, you know, hi highly regarded natural history uh, chap. You know, wouldn't be known in the US, but uh, certainly known in the UK. David Attenborough? D David Attenborough. Oh, yeah. famous. Oh, yeah. very good. Oh, well, he is. Very good, very good. Him. Uh, but I think the latest episode here is narrated by Sigourney Weaver, actually. Yeah, right. I think the voiceover has been done. And, uh, yeah, you can see evidence of that here and there. But nonetheless, um, I think the editorial values that are brought to bear to that production are squarely, and, and I can assure you, absolutely non-commercial. The way it might be packaged up to get to the U.S. market and have uh, the most visibility is, is um, uh, to some degree, uh, a separate question, but no, uh, you know, I, see, I see where you're coming from. We're, we're increasingly keen to get to BBC branded channels now and rely less on syndication in the US market. So that's changed back again a little bit, but uh, yeah. So by branded, the BBC America brand, as well as the, the regular BBC programming, it's, you know. I, I want to get to a couple more I issues before we wrap up. We have a little bit of time, but one of them, of course, is, is the issue of net neutrality. But first, I, I want to talk about diversity. And I think on the panel that we heard before lunch, we heard a lot of talk about what does diversity look like as you scale into a social media world. And um, I think that one thing that, that it remains a question for media in the US, and I would assume on some level in the UK, um, is the diversity of the newsrooms, mm -hmm. you know? And in the US last year, newsroom diversity in terms of hiring dropped in television, print, and radio mm -hmm. wow. at the same time that American diversity is increasing. I think that's shameful and stupid, but you know, um, it's one thing to say it's shameful and stupid, it's something else to do something about it. Yeah. So how do you deal with it in your shop? Well, what I did was I started Frontline World for that purpose so that we, we would be able to have uh, a lot more choices of programs to be able to be done. So we would have smaller budgets, but we'd be able to reach out and get more people to be able to get a more diverse uh, collection of, uh, of people who could both get a chance to produce and report um, for Frontline. That was a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's a very small part of it. I think the great problem, in, and I'm speaking once again just in terms of public television, the world I know, is that there is so little production being done. There's so little really serious journalism being done in the system that that's kind of the primary objective is to, first of all, I think we have to create the engine of production, the kinds of programs that will hire people and build newsrooms. And that means on a local level and on a national level. I mean, I think the re there are many things that have been said both in the report that's published today and I think said here uh, and said earlier by Craig uh, that I think are very important about 
rebuilding public broadcasting stations and to make them become responsive to their communities. And I think what the mechanism to do that is, is a number of suggestions out there, some kind of carrot and stick system that is on the one hand saying to you, you have a public interest that you have to meet and that they will, you will be rewarded um, if you meet that, if you begin to actually pragmatically join forces with other um, new media, uh, public journalism enterprises in your community and that the bricks and mortar that have been paid for through all those capital campaigns over all those years need to begin to be used to be opened up to to house those kinds of productions i think that will go a long way to creating the kind of possibilities for that and i think on the national level there's a similar idea and i've i'm not going to get into it now but i've long been banging a drum about a massive infusion of journalism into public television public radio has got a very a terrific record built on NPR. Public television needs to needs to make an enormous commitment, I think, and and the money that you all are going to find out of the trust fund that you're going to you're going to put together um, needs to be able to pay for, I think, uh, a, a, a massive uh, commitment to the part of public media. And with that goes the whole idea that you will reach out, and that that is fundamental to the makeup of those newsrooms and those programs. What about at the top of the food chain though? I'm just going to I'm just going to go all the way there. Sure. What's your shop look like? My shop is is um, white Hispanic um, <laughs> Sorry. I was told there were no questions earlier, but now it seems there might be time for questions. Sure. So I but please. White please and Hispanic. Um, <laughs> and, I won't feel personally and active, offended. And actively looking. Um, uh oh, <laughs> he's never he's never getting out of here alive. <laughs> Ever, the, he'll be covered looking. in business cards, just struggling Act under a pile. Actively looking. Okay, well, you know, uh, why don't you go ahead, John, if you have any reflections on on the issue of diversity, and then I will go to questions. I was told to wrap up at. 205, is that still roughly accurate? Okay. And is someone going to be mic handling for questions or are people just going to get up and scream? Take the mic around and if you raise your hands, we'll. Okay, great. So. Uh, Very quickly, in terms of human diversity, uh, which I, I think was the point, um, I mean, our, the lady who runs all of our television channels is, is an American lady, very successful, uh, Jaina Bennett. And uh, I think we make great efforts to get sort of gender equality within the BBC. I think um, we have had some uh, criticism recently for there being not enough, or perceived to have been not enough, uh, older women, uh, by which I think was meant over 50, uh, which is an interesting definition, um, on news and reading news. And I think that we've been vulnerable to, to some attacks there, but we're making uh, great efforts not to. But in terms of diversity of coverage, I think that's a very important issue. On occasion, if we felt ourselves getting rather too parochial, uh, we'll make sure that the international volume of coverage is dialed up slightly, helped by the fact that we broadcast in um, uh, you know, most countries in the world, so we can bring back stories from the World Service and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think that you know, the price is, is, is constant vigilance, really, and, uh, and, and certainly with regard to the ethnic balance, we've got a lot of work to do. All right, well, we're going to go to questions now, so... Thanks. I one over I'll start here and... Far corner. I some back there, and yep. I saw some more hands over here as okay, well. Great. Just to just state your name and and um, and where you're from, and then ask your question. I'm Carrie Biggs Adams. I'm work here in Washington D.C. I'm a union official with NABET CWA, part of the Communications Workers. And my question has to do with public television, but public radio as well here in the U.S. Uh, we see a horrible trend of anti-unionism, anti-worker behavior going on inside of this. Maybe it mirrors what we've experienced in the commercial networks, and now it's come to, to PBS, to NPR, to their stations. And I wondered if you had any insight uh, about that. Is that the taking the cloth thing coming down to the workers at that level? I mean, there's no question that public te television stations are hurting and uh, are hurting financially. Uh, that's just across the board, and uh, it's w hurting on a national level. I, th I think this is no different than any industry right now, particularly an industry that's hard hit, I think, 
and, uh, and has uh, um, squeezed for resources and uh, have um, agreements that have been in place for a long time that I think, you know, uh, there has been uh, um, a fair amount of, uh, of, uh, of difficulties um, in different stations. I, I don't, I'm not involved at all in those negotiations. Um, we are, I'm, I'm not, you know, there is a, a television station, WGBH, but we're really a production unit that works around the country in different circumstances. So I really can't say more than that. But I know it's, a, it's an issue of difficulty in, in, in stations. I, I'll just say quickly that, you know, a, a lot of the places I've worked had wonderful, um, you know, broadcast engineers, sound engineers, um, as well as camera and, and sound people who worked in the field who are now unemployed or, or being let go. Um, the reality is that I don't think a lot of people who used to be producers or on-air talent only necessarily want to do everything um, any more than the people who used to d to do make the sound great or make the picture great want to lose their jobs. But, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer, but I, I think that in, in certain cases I've seen the process handled very messily of how you move into the digital era. Mm -hmm. I think it could have been handled better, but I also think that the reality is Newsrooms today are not going to support the same number of people as they did in the past. I mean, there's just not going to be money to have as many people who are specialists in anything. And I don't know how that process gets justified because it hurts me because most of the, you know, a lot of the sound engineers I knew, you know, they were let go and they may never work as sound engineers again. Um, and it changes the sound of radio. Um, and when you lose camera people, it, it changes what television looks like. At the same time, I don't know that there is a business model that will support the same number of highly specialized trained professionals. And I wish I knew more about what the conversation sounded like so that you could get the best possible outcome given this market. My name is Lynn Barclay. I'm from Massachusetts. This is a question for John. And um, I'm wondering, as we grapple in the United States with these issues around uh, independence of the media and journalism quality and public media, if there are uh, rules, laws, policies, funding mechanisms in the UK that, that you sit around and think, why aren't they just doing this in the United States? And if you could tell us what they are. That's a great <laughs> one. That's a great one. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to give lessons, I think, given the relative funding positions uh, and, and histories. But um, I think, the, the, as I said earlier, the idea that significant public funding is a reflection of state control is, is frankly wrong if you've got the right mechanisms in place. I think it's, it shows due regard for the public's um, view uh, of what we do as a public good. Uh, and I think it does, it, does, uh, it does speak for that. And the fee that's paid to us, uh, a lot of our income comes from a license fee which you pay to own a television in the UK um, but that's a fee paid to the BBC it's not a um, perceived anyway as a sort of general government tax as it were I think the sort of things we do we have to show as every um, broadcaster does in the UK d d due um, respect for audience um, and uh, audiences expectations of impartiality so we couldn't do, we literally wouldn't be able to do Fox News style reporting, that sort of editorialising on the news in favour of one party or another um, uh, is, isn't, isn't possible under the regulations, for, for, for us at least. Um, and certainly for us to get behind a particular government or back them in any way is um, anathema, it, but both in terms of the values that our journalists are, 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 are trained in and brought up with, um, but also in, in terms of the way we are run, uh, there are some, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, some linkages. We have to have conversations about the setting of our income every five years. Uh, I think very important, the mechanic, is that our income level is set uh, only every five years. So it doesn't get dragged through Parliament yearly. And in that respect, your, your leash becomes so short, you're inevitably politically motivated to some degree. Uh, also, we have, um, a, you might call it a sort of great big... SLA uh, service -like level agreement really called the Charter, and that that defines what we're put on earth to do, as it were, um, you know, to inform, educate, and entertain to the highest possible standard, and so on and so forth. That is set every ten years, 
So again, the long cycle of that charter protects us from, from political independence over a, over a decade. And it's an article of faith in UK politics. Occasionally, people you know, might bring it up, but th the idea that that's set for, for, for 10 years is very important, I think, uh, to us indeed. Uh, I'd say that's the most important, but the, the, the values and training and everything else is, uh, I is very important too. But I don't think anyone would accuse us, and certainly no British politician would accuse us of being in the, in the, um, in the pockets of, of a particular political party. So we've managed to pull that trick off, of, of, uh, if you like. I do yeah. think there's a business oh, model. If a second, Joaquin, I was Take your time. sorry about that. Um, I do think there's a business model that's at the heart of public broadcasting, which is very interesting and I think is very powerful. There are some posit a lot of positive things to say about public broadcasting. One is, of course, the high level of trust in the country. I think, and I go back um, be to this issue of pledge, at the heart of the pledge idea is, the, is, the, is membership. And membership is a very particular mechanism in, in public broadcasting that I think is quite unique. And the question is, why is it so successful? And it's successful, I think, because it is a marriage between private interests, the individuals, and a kind of civic trust. And the civic trust, I think, is endorsed by the fact that the, that, 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 gov that, that the government does put money up towards public broadcast. As you know, only about 15% actually ends up. The rest of it is all is actually money that comes through the appropriation. The balance of money in the, in the, in the budgets overall of public broadcasting comes from other sources, including everything from underwriting to foundations to membership. But that's a very particular mechanism, and it's something that's really quite important. I think it can be built on. And I think to the extent that there is a much larger statement of the importance of public broadcasting in this country, I think it, it, it has the potential to pull a much larger civic engagement in it, in the, in the mechanism of trust. Joaquin. Um, I think that where the question of public broadcasting comes up, there are some really important examples. So Rob Schulman's in the audience, Maryland Public Television, talks about it not as pledge, but as their investors, their community partners, right. and folks are truly members of Maryland Public Television, which then gives them some capacity to do some really entrepreneurial work in education and other things. So I think there are some, there are some obvious great things already happening, but there are some major systemic issues. But like many big public systems, it's very hard to measure or agree on how things should be measured. So I'd like to maybe ask each of you to reflect on what might be an interesting and compelling strategy for measuring either the impact or the gap um, for public media in the United States. And, and that way we can maybe identify how to best address filling those challenges. Or small, what do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, well, the, 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 the we do have, we haven't taken any questions from the other side of the room and we're running out of time, so. so, so just what just I mean is, point. if we say that public, that there's not enough journalism, public broadcasting should fill in, right. how much demand is there that we're not filling? Um, if we are challenging that there's not enough diversity, how best to measure the impact of the diversity work that we are doing and what could also be done, not just in terms of who's working there, but the content represented and the audience. And then there's so many vast differences between the BBC and the United States model that it's almost not worth talking about because we're never going to get the BBC. Um, and as somebody who's been inside of the system and outside of the system, I think we have to get very entrepreneurial about creating a new hybrid model that is not saying, why can't we have what they have? We've got to build something that's native to this country and uh, reflects the realities on the ground. So, Joaquin, you know, you are doing some of that entrepreneurial work um, in, in creating ways to use public insight journalism. Um, and I, I would go, I mean, like, Honestly, I would I would go to like the the street corner test and the mall test and go out and do some yeah. focus groups yeah. outside of you know um, I mean outside of a place like the museum and just like go down to Mondawmin Mall in Baltimore and find out if anybody's consuming your product. I, I Everybody's going to be on mobile, and if you're supposedly doing mobile content and nobody knows about it, then you've got a problem. <laughs> you know, go go. I mean, like send people. I mean, I, I, I mean when when. I'm working on the project that I'm doing, I, in, I intend to go out. And, and, and of course, every time you ask a question, you also then disturb the waters. You know, there, there, is, there is no such thing as a, a clean line of questioning because you always then influence the people who you're talking to. 
But on some level, you also want them to know about what you're, I mean, you don't want to prejudice, prejudice them about how they feel about it, but if you're talking about public inside journalism, you want them to be active. So hey, what do you got going on on your phone? What do you use it for? Also, I mean, I, I, I just believe that you have to leave the house in order to, to get answers to some of these questions. And I think a lot of times we don't, we don't do all the work that we need to do. And because sometimes it's humiliating and embarrassing to realize that you're not as important as people think you are. I was just going to come, come in quickly <laughs> to say, on, on, the, on the benefit or otherwise of trying to export the BBC model, yeah, I can absolutely see the, the, the big issues on that. But I think your point is a very profound one. How do you measure the public value of extra provision in this area? And I think having a methodological framework for that, whether it's reach, impact, quality, value, public value, I think is really profound. It's a great way of opening up the, uh, the debate. Um, I think uh, the point about audiences' views is crucial. Getting out there, deliberative research, quantitative research to say, you know, what are your expectations of due impartiality? How many, how many different views would you consider that you need in order to form a coherent view about X or Y? Obviously, you need to frame these in, in, in much more pithy uh, language. Uh, but I think that is key. That that is key to building up the, the body of evidence that this needs to be taken more seriously. That there is maybe a democratic deficit in coverage or uh, what have you. Um, I want to see if there's an, a question from the other side of the room, just because. Okay, we've got we've got a table um, over there. Is there a microphone we can send over here? Okay, we're going to take one here, and then we'll we'll move over to the other. Ah, table. okay, great. They're and panning. We'll They're panning left. Excellent. <laughs> I didn't realize. We please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica Duda. Until recently, I worked at PBS in their interactive department. I was wondering if you could take a longer view on crowdsourcing and user-generated content, because as discussed earlier today, you know, the internet has been publicly available the past 10 years. Consumer media products have been available about that same time. And if we look at um, kind of public, you know, created media, yes, it's okay. It's, you know, the production for you to take it in is difficult, but 10 to 20 years from now, if Free Press, for example, were to advocate towards the uh, education committees on the Hill for national funding, through the Department of Education for national standards, to ensure that media production is available in the public schools, unlike just limiting it to rich private schools, rich suburbs, 10 to 20 years from now, you might have a different group of people that you're working with. And I'll close by saying that this past weekend, I was playing basketball with my six-year-old nephew, and of course, I have to pull out the camera to take pictures, and after 45 minutes of doing this, he was getting really good. And I you know, would take a shot. Of course, he wanted to see it immediately. And he had a great, beautiful shot, I have to say, of myself, of me shooting it. But when I showed it to him, he said, hey, it looks like I actually made that shot. Because he knew mm. he did it. Mm. And I said, this is a really good lesson for you to understand that just because there's a picture of something doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> That's awesome. And so if he can understand that now, Think about what these kids can do 10 or 20 years from now. Does anyone want to pick up on that? Well, I, I think you're right. I, will, we, I, I think that will be the contribution. We will find more increasingly sophisticated levels of, of production. Uh, the question in terms of as journalists and, and as, as somebody who lives inside of a formal editorial frame, I think the continuing question will be, do people understand the values of journalism? Are, are we are we going to continue to hold kind of standards and practices to that? Will we have an editorial structure uh, into which it gets? And not everything, by the way, has to go into that. I don't believe that. The, the, I believe there is a space for a vibrant and an opinionated um, uh, uh, ecology of, of media. But I think within the journalism space, as much of the rest of media becomes uh, more partisan, uh, there is a space for a place like the BBC, which says we're going to try to hold to high standards of fairness, but also be as tough-minded as we can and hold, uh, hold uh, 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 people in power to task. Uh, I think that needs to be done. To there is an enormous uh, growth of investigative journalism groups now, and the amount of work that's going to begin to be done, I think, using these new tools and uh, is, is, is very challenging and, very and, 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 and holds great possibility on the local level and on the national level. And, and, and that's, that's, of course, stepping... Uh, but I think it's going to attract people who can learn to use these new tools. Yeah. Um, just lest you thought I was um, too negative uh, earlier when I, when I was talking about the, 
tendency of media now to concentrate back into fewer and fewer hands, despite this proliferation of the means of production. You look at the UK, and even though we do have a vibrant media sector in the UK, uh, of the 15 most used websites by British people, only one is British. All of the others now are from this country, and they're very good and high quality, but they're very often you know, large corporate MSN, Google, eBay, YouTube, and so on. So the ability of a culture to reflect itself back at its own population and, and enhance its uh, civic society, democracy, is challenged online. And I think that we're number four, uh, and we're struggling to keep that position. And, and to those who would, and there are many uh, you know, critics, big corporate critics of the BBC that we face internally, we were to give up that would end up with 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 with, with none at all, as it were. But but I think I think the um, uh, the cause is not lost altogether. We just we just need to uh, to carry on. Yeah. And and I would say just quickly, I think a lot of it is about building infrastructures that include both journalists and non-journalists, because there are a lot of people who do journalistic tasks who are not journalists, including people who edit Wikipedia pages, including people who do community newsletters. There are a lot of people who understand some of the rudiments of journalism, and the question is, how do you reach people where they are with the skill sets they have, um, lay out some ground rules, enhance those skill sets, and build a collaborative means of producing you know, uh, a filtering of content? Because so much of this is about content curation. And in some ways, I'm less concerned about content you know, generation than I am about curation and making sense out of the, the, the great noise that is content right now. And I think that there are ways that you can build structures online that allow people to rate things to, I mean, like Talking Points Memo, I was at this fascinating talk, and I'll, I'll move very quickly. Um, Talking Points Memo is basically going to have people do um, joint annotation of public documents because it knows it has a highly educated audience and mm -hmm. it can use that labor. And, that, yeah. and they're creating tools for that. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yes, my name is Irene Meals. I was formerly a journalist and now I'm a lawyer. And I fell into something recently that combined both uh, careers. I was asked to write some articles about uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs for our local condominium newspaper. And in the process discovered that they were a real threat to health and safety. <laughs> See what so I'm talking about? Uh, so uh, I kept trying to tell people that, and everybody go, oh, they last so long. Well, they only last long if you keep them on all the time. That's the only time they last a long time. And in the meantime, they do things. Uh, for in fact, only th three or four states have made recycling mandatory. Uh, if everybody recycled, they found that it wouldn't be cap they wouldn't be capable of handling it. If they were so capable so of handling it, wait, let me get through, uh, right. they'd have to impose a tax. Well, generally, I found they were terrible. I have since been trying to tell all kinds of people, in, including ProPublica, and I wondered, do you run into a situation where your public interest has to fall because of the commercial interest? It turns out that throughout the country now, we have thousands of light bulbs, and everybody wants to sell those, and so nobody's talking about the fact that they're terrible. Bye -bye. All right, uh, so we have a specific question uh, about um, these, these light bulbs, and I have no knowledge whatsoever about the light bulbs, what I, but what I can say is that this is the kind of questioning that's going to go on, you know, where people come across issues of specific interest, and there have been many cases where people find issues of specific interest that turn out to have news value. How, how do we as journalists address the needs of people who find what, what they think are important stories and we may or may not agree. How do you vet that? Well, I, I mean, it's it's a it's a perf it's a it's a good question, and one that obviously needs to be surfaced and discussed and put out there. And in fact, it's the exactly the appropriate kind of question for um, for a kind of public insight journalism, where you can get people who have expertise to to come into it, and where you can, on a local level, if there are those kinds of um, uh, 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 programs set up uh, to be able to, to engage that. And, and it's, it's in doing the work on that local level, precisely the kind of work that you do, that then gets the attention finally, and fi may take a while, of somebody on, on the next larger level to be able to pick it up and take it, and take it on and to investigate it. I don't know the story, I've now, I'll write it down. But we, <laughs> we're gonna right, do we're gonna one, one, one more short more question, question and then wrap. 
Thank you, Sam Husseini. What, what about, I mean, doesn't public media need to examine itself in terms of uh, editorial timidity at times? I, I don't remember a, uh, you know, a frontline documentary, you know, Bush is lying about WMDs back in 2002 or 2003. Shouldn't institutions like BBC and CBC and, and PBS and Democracy Now! and so on be having reporters in the White House who are asking the tough questions on a day-in, day-out basis instead of relying on a weekly show or a periodic oh, show? I think so there's on. no question it was. And by the way, we did a film in 2001, two months after 9-11, called Gunning for Saddam. So, um, but yes, there should be hard questions asked, and there should be more of them. And I think it should be much more tough-minded. I think there's no question that public broadcasting, and that goes public radio, public television, and, and, other, uh, and any other entities, should be drawing towards us the strongest, toughest journalists we can and ask the hardest questions. I think, I think that's exactly what we should be doing. And we need to do more of it. I mean, what we need in public television is more journalism, a lot more journalism and a lot better journalism. I and would just say I, I don't think access equals hard-hitting journalism. You know, there was a, you know, on, on uh, the website, the Washington Note, which is run by Steve Clemens, a, a Washington-based blogger, he raised questions about whether or not uh, the press was tumbling over itself to try to please President Obama and withholding information in exchange for fu possible interviews for future books. I believe that a lot of the problems with Washington-related coverage is that people want access. I mean, like, if you really care whether or not you're going to get an invitation to the White House Christmas party, that may cause problems in your reporting. So I'm not sure that we should equate access with, you know, with... Well, yeah, I know. I'm just saying that you, you raised, shouldn't they be in the White House? Maybe they should be nowhere near the White House, you know? <laughs> All right. Well, <coughs> thanks so much for our panel. Thank you. Thanks, Marit.